Hello students, today we will talk about one of the most exciting things. It is glass technology. The purpose of glass synthesis is to obtain a homogeneous in physical properties and chemical composition glass forming liquid. The source material for the glass is called the batch. Here you can see the glass synthesis stages. We will go through all of them and we will talk separately. In industrial glass fabrication, the choice of the composition uh, is based on three main considerations – product requirements, process requirements, and costs. The final composition of the glass results from the best from compromise between these two three aspects. Mostly glass composition consists of glass network formers, network modifiers, and intermediates. Glass network formers are elements that form the interconnected glass backbone. Network modifiers alter the glass network, com compensated by non-bridging oxygen ions, and they also reduce glass network connectivity. Intermediates are elements that can function either as glass network formers or as glass network modifiers, depending on the glass composition. Glass formers are usually covalently bonded anions to which network modifiers ionically bonded inside of the glass network. Um, modifiers usually are alkaline metal cations or alkaline earth cations, transmission metal cations, or sometimes lanthanides. Also, modifiers are divided into different groups according to their functions, but we will talk about it a little bit later. Uh, what well-known modifiers we can mention? One of the most um, widely used network modifier are, uh, are alkaline oxides. They are, it, it's for example sodium oxide, lithium oxide or potassium oxide. They are usually used to reduce viscosity of glass melts and so that means that to reduce the melting temperature of the glass. But usually they decrease glass chemical durability, so it is uh, it, you used to be very careful <laughs> by adding a lot of uh, alkali oxides. Alkaline earth oxides are usually used to produce uh, glass resistance to water and acid leaching, but they uh, sometimes also decrease glass durability. Boric oxide can be used as network former and as network modifier, and when we use it as network modifier, we should also use it to reduce glass synthesis temperature. And one of the most widespread intermediate elements or intermediate material is aluminum oxide. It can be used as network former as, as, and as network modifier, but when we use it as network modifier, we usually use it to increase resistance to devitrification of the glass composition. So, uh, how can we understand what is a glass former or what is the glass modifier? If we are talking about the structure of the sodium silicate glass, we can say that silicon ions, silicon is the glass former. The structure of the pure silicon is here. When we add to the structure of the pure silicon sodium oxide, we produce non-bridging oxygen ions because sodium becomes the network modifier. Also, we can say what elements are glass formers or glass modifiers just by having a glance on the chemical table. Here we can see that boron, silicon, phosphorus, germanium, arsenic and antimony are really pure glass formers. Aluminium, as you can see here, is an intermediate element that can be as can play a role as a glass former or a glass modifier.
here you can see the mostly widespread glass formats, most of them, excluding aluminium oxide, can form um, the simplest one component glasses. So, for example, silicon oxide can form quartz glass that is, consists only from silicon, silicon and oxygen atoms. Germanium oxide, boron oxide also can produce one component glass, uh, which are made only from germanium oxide and boron oxide. Only anionic structural units with coordination number of four uh, can form a three-dimensional network. Uh, what does it mean? It means that if we have the coordination number of the coordination unit in the coordination unit is three, it means that we have only three neighbors of this coordination unit. But if we have only three neighbors, it means that we have three different points and we can construct a plane that will contain all these three different points. And this means that such structural units can form only two-dimensional structure. But if we have a coordination number of four, it means that this structural unit can form a three-dimensional structure. But it doesn't mean that boron oxide glass is only two-dimensional. No, it means that the structure of the boron glass is not uh, looks like chains uh, which are situated at different levels. <coughs> Here you can see the commercial glass, com some of the commercial glass compositions. One of the most widespread soda lime silicate and sodium bor borosilicate glasses that are usually used uh, in flat glass, window gl or window glass, lamp glass, lens, and laboratory, uh, and laboratory as laboratory glass. Also, we can see that one company, sili vitreous silicon glass, as I was talking previously also is used in telecommunications, lab equipment, and in producing optical elements. When we see the chem chemical composition of the glass, or the main constituents of the glass, we can name this glass just by looking at his composition. For example, here we can, we have soda, lime, silicate glass. And here we have sodium boro silicate glass. This class can glass can be also named like as sodium lime boro silicate glass, and so on and so forth. The last constituent that are mentioned in the glass composition are usually the main constituent, uh, which uh, we have in the biggest amount of the of the glass. What about preparation of raw materials of the glass composition? Usually uh, we use raw materials for preparing glass either from mineral sources or from chemical production. What does it mean mineral sources? It means that we find some mineral deposit and uh, take our sand, our raw materials from there. Uh, the main advantage of raw materials from mineral sources is that they are very cheap, the low cost of them. But um, they, their composition are usually, usually varies from time to time, and usually they contain in uncontrolled impurities in their composition. What about um, chemical nature of the raw materials. Such raw materials have high purity, really, and uh, less variations in compositions during time. But of course, they have a very high cost, especially comparing 
with raw materials from mineral sources. For example, uh, one the most widespread raw material for glass production is silica or silicon oxide. The raw materials for silica are crystalline quartz in nature, rock crystal, kaolin, nepheline, spodumena, feldspars, and quartz sand. And for example, if we look at the composition of quartz sands from different deposits, we will see that really they contain different amount of impurities and their composition varies. For example, here we have several mineral deposits that are situated on the territory of Russia, Ukraine and Crimea. We see that the amount of silicon oxide here varies uh, for more than 1%. It means that it uh, will vary from time to time. We also ha here have the titanium oxide and the iron oxide. And it really it can be in a really big amount here. <coughs> Raw materials are typically divided into classes that are connected with their function. So, as we are talking about previously, they are network formers, uh, ne network modifiers that are very often used as uh, carbonates. Intermediates that are often aluminum oxide and zirconium oxide. The tricky thing about aluminum oxide is that it is also used as a refractive, as a refractory material for furnaces production, tanks production, and ports production. That's why um, the main thing during glass melting is uh, to be sure that all aluminum oxide is also melted inside of the glass melt. Talking about carbonates. Uh, for network modifiers raw materials they can be for example sodium carbonate that usually takes as soda ash potash potassium carbonate limestone that is calcium carbonate or dolomite that contains several carbonates and its composition uh, fine agents are elements that are used for removal of bubble of bubbles from the melt. They are used for you know, to enhance the removal of the soft gases and gas bub bubbles that are trapped inside of the melt. And they are usually added in really small amounts, in really small quantities, in the glass batch. Redox active species are used to control uh, the oxidizing and reducing conditions inside of the glass melt. Really, uh, redox, that is mean oxidize or reduce, um, is very, uh, potential is very important to control because, you know, we have uh, chemical elements that uh, can have different valences and uh, at different types of valences, they can produce even different colors or be colorless. So, for example, if we uh, produce colorless glass, we really don't want uh, to have iron, iron in the velocity of three plots there. <coughs> Usually, oxidizing agents are nitrates and sulfates, and reducing agents are include carbon or coke and blast furnace, furnace slags. Coloring elements. So that elements that provide us color uh, as for example iron oxide which is one of the most widespread color coloring element. You see that even mm. mineral deposits of uh, glass of quartz sand all of them contain iron oxide in the composition. Uh, usually coloring elements are added in also in small quantities uh, of less than one weight percent. 
um, besides iron oxide, we used cobalt oxide, manganese oxide, copper oxide, and so on and so forth. For example, here, if we can see in the table, we see that almost all glass types contain iron oxide in their composition. The less are optical and crystal glass. Crystal glass in Russian will be crystal. And the biggest composition, the biggest amount of iron oxide is the bottled green glass. Sometimes we don't need to color the glass, but to decolor it, to uh, make it colorless. In this case, we uh, instead of coloring elements, we use decoloring elements. Uh, the decoloring elements are usually selenium uh, in the pure form as metal or in uh, compounds. Mel melting accelerants are elements that promote melting of the glass at low temperatures or uh, glass formation at early melting phases. The most widespread melting accelerants are fluorospar, it's the calcium fluoride, lithium carbonate and sodium sulfate. We use nucleating agents when we want uh, to obtain a controlled crystallization of the glass. So it means that we here produce uh, glass ceramics from the glass. Usually nucleating agents are uh, ammonium fluoride compounds. And in the end, one of the raw materials is the colored. It can be internal and external. What does it mean internal colored? It means that the col internal colored is the same glass that was produced in the same furnace but for example a day or a week or a month before and now it, it is added to the raw materials to the batch of the glass again. So it is the same glass but uh, which was produced earlier. And external colored is the glass that came through people. So, for example, um, it is uh, uh, crushed bottles from uh, milk or from Coca-Cola or from any other beverages. So, external colored is uh, really hard to use because uh, the, really we don't know the composition of this glass. So that's why uh, it is usually separated on color glass or color bottles and colorless bottles to be used in, in production of different types of glasses. Uh, it means that external color uh, contains uh, many impurities that cannot be controlled and uh, mm, that's why we like internal color more. But uh, nevertheless, colored internal or external, it um, provides us to use less energy to melt in the glass. And it means that uh, less energy means less cost of the glass production. So here you can see the transmission spectrum for colored containing glasses. Here you can see the wine bottle. Uh, which is colored uh, by the amber chromophore. It's the um, the, fer the iron ions uh, with the valence three plus and the sulfur ions uh, with the valence uh, two minus. That they produce. Uh, they are called amber chromophore and they produce this color, deep green. So um, this bottle. Uh, was produced from uh, from iron oxide and uh, light green brottle was produced from the glass that contained chromium oxide uh, where the chromium is the in the free valence state. So here you can see again that uh, iron oxide is almost 
in every gloss type. What is the main requirements for the raw materials? First, of course, is the grain composition. The grain size for the raw materials should be no more than uh, 0.70.8 millimeters. Also, the main parameter is, is humidity. If we are dealing with the solder batch, uh, the humidity should be no more than 3-5% and sulfate batch uh, no more than 7%. Also, gas content. Uh, it's not uh, the gas means like uh, argon or something like that or oxygen. It's um, the dissolved gases. So, for example, water vapor or so on and so forth. Uh, for certain lime glass, the gas content should be no more than 20%. And the batch should be uniform. It means that we should mix it and uh, we should talk about it a little bit later. What about grain composition? How to control it? Um, on the factory, during production, we use a system of sieves with uh, different diameters of the holes. And that's why uh, we that that's how we can control the grain size of so small diameter. <clears throat> if we look um, in th at the table, we can see the different gas content of different batches. We can see that gas content should be no more than twenty percent for the soda lime glass. But here, you see the gas content twenty three. So this kind of the batch can't be used for glass production, uh, first it should be prepared. But how we prepare the batch? First thing that we should do with the batch is to dry it. As you can see, we can have a lot of gases inside of the batch and one of them is a water vapor. And while drying the batch, we make its uh, amount less. Mostly, often, we dry sands and calcareous materials. Uh, that calcareous materials is materials um, based on the carbonates. Usually, mm, drying is occurred at, temp at high temperatures, so from 400 to 800 degrees. The second stage is the grinding. Uh, if we use um, mineral or natural, resources, mineral source or de mineral deposits to obtain our batch, it means that sometimes we get our raw materials in the form of the big stones. And that's why here we can use coarse grinding, for example, by crushing and splitting these stones. <clears throat> so coarse grinding is for big stones, and then after coarse grinding we use fine grinding uh, to obtain powder with a little grain size that um, is no more than one um, millimeter one millimeter uh, the method of grinding uh, depends on the materials hardness uh, required fairness of the uh, batch and uh, the size of the initial pieces that we have in the beginning. So if we are dealing with the big stones we used crushers and when we are dealing with the small stones or powder uh, we use very often meals. One uh, of the most wi widespread meal which is called ball meal is, is used uh, in uh, fine grinding. So sifting, again, after grinding, sifting uh, is the method of using sieves. Uh, mixing, waiting and mixing, I think that waiting is obvious. Mixing uh, is very important, even the mixing of the batch, because the uh, homogeneity of the glass and homogeneity of the glass melt is strongly depends on the homogeneity of the batch. So if we want to obtain homogeneous glass, we should have homogeneous batch. Batch briquetting is used to, um, at factories with big amounts of production. 
uh, batch bricketing is usually used for ma maintaining the homogeneity of the batch. So uh, when we produce the batch and have to store it for some time, we, ma we are making batch bricketing. So uh, if we obtain homoge homogeneous batch and we want to store it for some time and we want to have it still homogeneous, we use batch bricketing. Also, batch bricketing helps to eliminate the dusting of the batch. So, batch is powder, a chemical powder that uh, is sometimes hazardous for um, people that are working at that factory, and also for um, instruments and for the furnaces and so on and so forth, because batch is really chemically active powder. So, uh, bricketing provide, uh, eliminates dusting of the batch and also uh, it uh, eliminates organic impurities penetration inside of the batch. So, we produced our batch and bricket it, for example, to solve for some time. What happens next? Next, we should melt it. But during melting of the batch, we have uh, a lot of physical and chemical changes and processes that happened during this melting. Physical changes are the evaporation of the motion heating the batch, melting of its individual components, the solution of substances in a solid liquid state, crystal structure changes, for example, changes from one crystal modification to another, volatilization of some constituent parts. Uh, chemical reactions are very widespread, so it is this, the dissolution of the hydrates, removal of chemically bound water, decomposition of carbonates, sulfates, nitrites, and peroxides, interaction of various components to, uh, and formation of silicates, ferrates, germinates, and so on and so forth. Water is the mm, glass network former, so that will form. And physical chemical processes include interaction between glass melt and gases compounds components of the furnace atmosphere, interaction between melt and gases included in it, interaction between the gas phase of the melt and the gas phase of the bubbles inside of the melt, interaction between the furnace gases that are used for heating and gases included in the melt and bubbles inside it, and interaction between the glass melt and the refractory materials of the furnace, of the pot or of the tank. So, there are several types of uh, furnaces for uh, glass production. One, uh, nowadays, one of the most widespread is so-called day tank glass furnace. Uh, why it is called a day tank? Mm, day tanks are developed from traditional pot furnaces for small capacities, mm, more uh, less than 10 tons per day. Um, it is refilled with batch batch daily. Uh, the melting is going at night and uh, glass goes into production the next day. That's why it's called day tanks. So day tanks are usually um, used for colored glass, crystal glass and so special glasses. So for example, if we, we um, uh, have to produce many kinds of glasses, we usually should have several day tank glass furnaces. What happens in the day tank glass furnace? A vessel made of silicate materials that is called pot or crucible uh, is fired at uh, these temperatures. Fired at, temp at these temperatures is placed in the glass furnace heated to these temperatures, and after it, only after it, its temperature is raised to the synthesis temperature, because uh, we need the preheating of this pot. Um, to provide a compaction of its materials and an increase uh, of its an increase in its resistance to the influence of the batch and glass melt, because glass melt and batch are chemically active, they are chemically aggressive. That's why we preheat the pot to uh, make it more stable, more resistant to these chemically active materials. To protect the bottom of the pot from being corroded by the batch. Uh, the glass collet is first poured on its bottom, uh, then the batch is loaded alternately with the collet. So, if we are talking about laboratory port furnaces that are for only small volume glass production, 
uh, the batch is gradually filled in portions into the crucible in two or ten steps. After uh, the batch is heated, hydroscopic and chemically bound water evaporates from it. And the second type of the glass furnace is the continuous tank glass furnace. Uh, it is all, <laughs> almost exclusively used in the manufacture of the flat glass, container glass, and other mass-produced optical glass types. It, is, it has very <laughs> big sizes, no less than uh, 10 40 meters long, and uh, the, its output lies between 100 to 400 tons per day, and it requires continuous feeding of the batch here and continuous processing of the melt here. So it's non-stopping process that occurs uh, at day and at night. How does uh, the batch melt in the continuous tank glass furnace? Firstly, we have the batch of the room temperature. When we melt the batch and uh, at the temperature of 1200 degrees, its weight becomes really very small. If we compare this and this weight, we see that there's the difference of uh, 200 kilograms. Uh, this happens because batch loses weight because of the gases that goes out of it during chemical reactions. So here uh, we have 200 kilograms of gases. When we heat the batch uh, of the melt, the glass melt, up to 104, 1400 and 1500 degrees Celsius uh, to obtain grain sand grade solution and to make fining, uh, which we talk after this stage. So during gla glass, during batch melting, the formation of uh, glass network occurs. If we are talking about silicate glass, we are, then we are talking about formation of silicates. If we have worry glass or phosphate glass, we are talk about uh, we talk about chemical reactions with the formation of silicates, borates, and phosphates. Here we have thermal decomposition of the components. Um, the melting of the silicates, the dissolving silicates in one another. Uh, this stage usually completes at these temperatures. And uh, in the end, at 1200 deg degrees Celsius, we obtain an opaque melt with a large amount of gases and uh, batch particles inside of it. The main chemical reactions that uh, are going through the batch melting is uh, the reactions uh, of um, changing modifications of some materials. For example, if we are talking about silicon, it uh, goes through eight different modifications during melting. Here we see uh, that at the beginning we have alpha quartz. When it goes to beta quartz, which goes to beta trimidite, which goes to crystallite, and after that it melts to silica and fused silica. Soda uh, dissolutes into sodium oxide and carbon dioxide that flies away, and that's why the batch loses weight. Mostly uh, because of the carbon dioxide. Boric acid we use to uh, have uh, boron oxide. It uh, dissolutes into boron oxide and uh, water, and uh, it starts to lose water uh, from 200 degrees up to 900 degrees. So, sodium sulfate goes through rhombic to monoclinic modification, and at this temperature it dissolutes. Very carbonate also provide us carbon dioxide and barium oxide. And sodium nitrate at 
350 degrees centigrade provides us a lot of oxygen, nitrogen and uh, sodium oxide. Also, if we have, uh, if we're dealing with colored glasses, it means that we have some uh, coloring elements inside of it uh, that are copper oxide, manganese oxide, iron oxide and of course uh, chromium oxide. So, it means that during melting of the batch, uh, we have a conversion from one oxidation state to another. For example, here we see the chemical reaction of the manganese, of copper and of iron oxide. They can also form new chemical compounds and solid solution and they also participate in silicate formation reactions. Uh, this, um, reactions uh, that uh, involve uh, coloring agents are one of the most important because, uh, for example, if we are dealing with the divalent copper, divalent copper provides a light blue or even sometimes green color of the glass. But if we have such impurity inside of the glass batch, uh, we should heat it a little bit carefully because the monovalent copper in this oxide does not provide any color. So, for example, if we start melting our batch and when uh, we see that uh, it starts to have light blue color, then we should increase the temperature a little more or just uh, we should store at melting temperature for a little bit longer duration to just to be sure that all copper oxida um, reduces to the monovalent state. Uh, the same thing happens with the manganese oxide here and with the iron oxide. If we're talking about uh, nucleating agents or opacifiers that are usually called because they may, they are making opaque quartz, they usually fluoride compounds, uh, phosphate salts, and sometimes tin oxide. It also they are also going through several chemical reactions of the solution of decomposition that you can see here. So. Uh, talking about coloring agents, we know that redox conditions in glass melt are really very important. But if we have several elements of variable valences that can be uh, that are simultaneously presented in the glass, uh, which one will be oxidized first? So, if we're talking about silicate glass, the sequence will be as follows: first oxidizes iron, then antimony and so on and so forth and only the last will be the chromium. But not only gases volatile from the glass batch. Uh, the useful compounds such as boron oxide and so on, arsenos oxide, also are very volatile. The most volatile are boric acid and its salts lead oxide, arsenic compounds, antimony oxide, selenium and simple halides have the highest volatility. And even the volatility depends on the mm, mineral that we use as a raw material. For example, if we look uh, at sodium oxide from soda and so from sodium sulfate, we can see that from soda, sodium carbonate, the volatility is two times less this than from sodium sulfate here. And if we use fluorospar or calcium fluoride, it has almost 50% volatility from its initial composition, which is very high. And also we should uh, bear it in mind while calculating the batch composition. Okay. So, uh, we have the melt. What should we do next with it? Uh, on the previous slide, you 
you, you, we all saw that uh, the next stage of the glass synthesis is fining. Fining or primary fining is the process of the removal bubbles from the melt. It is combined with the final stage of the silicate formation and usually runs at the temperatures up to 1500 degrees Celsius. <clears throat> uh, here, uh, removal of gases that are contained in the melt in the form of bubbles from which a uh, large one rises to the surface of the melt uh, and small bubbles just dissolving it. Usually the rises of the big bubbles and the dissolution of the small bubbles are separated into fining process and refining process. And as a result of the fining, the melt becomes transparent but remains chemically inhomogeneous. <clears throat> In Russian language, fining process is called осветление. So why um, the melt becomes more lightening or more fining uh, without bubbles? If you imagine boiling water you uh, in your kettle for example if you are uh, looking inside of the boiling kettle you will uh, don't see its bottom because really when the water is boiling it's not transparent but when we remove of the bubbles the water again becomes transparent transparent here is the same process, so the melt with a lot of bubbles is not transparent, but when we remove the bubbles, it becomes transparent, but remains chemical and homogeneous. That's why in Russian this process is called осветление. What is the mechanism of the fining? Uh, I remind you that here we have visible bubbles inside the melt and invisible gases inside uh, that are dissolved in the glass melt. It means that we have chemically bonded uh, gases and that gases that are enclosed in raw materials and it is the main source of the gases inside of the glass melt. We have gases, uh, gases that, mechanically, that are mechanically driven into the melt, for example by the stereo or by moving the melt from one part of the tank to another part of the tank. We have gases that are specially introduced inside uh, the batch and we have gases from the atmosphere of the furnace. The melt uh, finding mechanisms consist uh, in creating certain equilibrium conditions between the liquid and gaseous phase of the melt on the other hand and between the melt and the furnace atmosphere on the other hand. The direction of the fining process is determined by the partial pressure of the gases inside of the melt and the pressure of gases in the bubbles. Namely, to remove the evolved gas from the melt, it is necessary uh, to have the partial pressure of the corresponding gases to be lower than the furnace atmosphere. And that's only in this case they will go out of the melt. So, what techniques can we use to enhance the fining process? Uh, we, should, we can increase the synthesis time, but sometimes it is not comfortable. We can increase the temperature during fining, that's why during fining the temperature is the highest. Uh, we can use mechanical steering of the glass melt, we can add fining agents to the batch. Uh, we were talking about it then a little bit earlier. And uh, we can use uh, high pressure, vacuum or ultrasound to remove the bubbles. What gases are contained in the molten glass? Mostly it's oxygen and carbon dioxide. Also it is sulfur dioxide, or water vapor and nitrogen. How do finding the agents work? They either increase the average bubble size, for example for water vapor, and they are also the source of the gases by themselves. That these gases pass from the melt into the bubbles. Uh, the bubbles are growing, they're increasing in the size and uh, when they 
are increasing in the size, it is easier for them to go out of the melt. Here we use nitrates, sulfates and ammonium salts for this. <coughs> So the next stage is conditioning. Conditioning uh, really contains uh, several processes. Uh, firstly, it's a cooling stage uh, from the fining temperature 1500 degrees up to again 1200 degrees Celsius. During conditioning we usually used, uh, we are usually making homogenization. It's the averaging of the Molten glass by composition. Conditioning is usually uh, usually runs in parallel with refining. I remind you that refining is a dissolution of the small bubbles uh, inside of the melt. Refining is uh, carried out at low temperatures because the solubility of most gases in the melt increases with decreasing temperature. Here we have mixing of microsections, heterogeneous and chemical compositions to avoid stries. Stries you can see here on the pictures. And here the most effective is uh, mechanical steering with a stirrer, which is usually of the same material as the pot. The next is uh, stage is the forming of the glass. So, during conditioning we start to cool it down and we continue cooling it down. So, uh, during cooling we should, uh, we should be sure that uh, that we are making continuous slow decrease in temperature so that uh, without changing the composition and the pressure of the glass medium of the gas medium near the melt. The first method of cooling is cooling the glass in the same port or crucible in which it was melted. Uh, so this method is usually uh, used when we are synthesizing glass and in the day tank, glass furnace or port, port furnace. Uh, the second amount of cooling uh, is uh, then when we are cooling glass after forming. This is usually used in the continuous tank glass furnaces. So uh, we have several methods of glass forming. The drawing, blowing, pressing, centrifuging, rolling and the last method is casting. For example, uh, here we have several operations of pressing the glass and then blowing it to obtain a vessel. <clears throat> so drawing is one of the most widespread because it is used for flat glass, tube glass and fiber, fiber glass and LCD glass. Um, the last thing is the glass casting is uh, mm, namely it, it is not the, mm, the type of the glass forming just casting. What means glass casting? It means that the glass mass is cast into a round or square or rectangular shape with an area of uh, 2 to 4 square meters with the thickness of the glass block is approximately no more than 30 centimeters or, uh, we, or we can cast glass on the table or rolling, uh, roll it into the sheet and hold it uh, on the table for several minutes the second point is uh, for the very small volumes of the glass production. And one of the main stages that really affect the glass, um, the glass quality and the glass optical properties is annealing. Do you, what do you know about thermal con conductivity of glasses? I think they know that uh, heat transfer in solids occurs due to thermal conductivity. And when a body is heated or cooled, a temperature gradient inevitably arises between its surface and its inner parts. Uh, we know that surface is directly involved in the heat exchange with the environment. <clears throat> so if we have, for example, some glass sheets, it means when, that when we are heating it 
when, for example, here's some unlimited plate of flowers, the temperature of the surface layers will be higher than the temperature of the volume of the inner layers. And when we cool it, it means that the temperature of the surface layers is lower than the temperature of the volume layers. Temperature gradient delta T uh, depends on thermal conductivity of glass, the size of the glass block or the glass plate, and the rate of cooling or heating. When we start cooling some glass block or blank, uh, the rate of heating the surface and the volume is different. It means uh, that, but for some time, if we continue heating with the same rate in ideal modeling, um, the heating rate of all points, either surface or volume ones, will be the same. So, repeating, when we start heating the glass sample, the heating rate of the surface and volume differs because the surface is heating in the higher rates. But uh, during some time, the heating rate of all points of the glass block uh, will be the same. And this uh, time period is called transition period. <clears throat> and uh, the time when all points of the all layer, all layers of the glass block are heating at the same rate is called regular regime. Here, if we look at the equation, we see that we have plus and minus. Plus is going for heating and minus is for cooling. <clears throat> so, while we heat or cool some body, uh, the formation of internal stresses occur. Temperature gradient uh, causes uneven expansion and contraction of outer and inner glass layers. And because of this expansion and contraction, elastic deformations of tension and compression occurs. <clears throat> so this is the picture for heating and this picture for cooling the glass samples. If uh, the temperature range in which we um, cool or heat the glass is very low, for example, we are heating or cooling glass at temperatures around room temperature, then these elastic deformations will be temporary. They will disappear when along with the temperature changes. If we are cooling, but if we are cooling or heating the glass, at temperatures that are near glass transition temperature so or higher for example heating or cooling the glass melt then these uh, stresses these deformations will relax because uh, at this temperature range the glass is uh, in the plastic state so its uh, structure is uh, very uh, can be formed and deformed. But if we cool the glass from higher temperatures, from temperatures around glass transition temperature, down to the room temperature, uh, at room temperature the glass is elastic, is in elastic brittle state. So during this cooling from high temperatures to low temperatures, these stresses will remain, and these stresses then will, called, will be called residual stresses. One of the uh, most uh, widely known example of the residual stresses is the drop of the Prince Rupert that you can see here. Different colors here are all residual stresses that are inside of the drops. You can, uh, you can watch uh, a lot of videos about a drop of the Prince Rupert. Please, you're welcome. What about uh, changes of optical parameters? As you know, one of the most important optical parameters of the optical glass is refractive index. 
and uh, it is it it usually changes with the temperature too for example if we have a glass melt at this temperature and when uh, and then we start to cool it down then uh, the refractive index of the glass melt uh, will change like this when we reach this temperature which is called the upper limit of the critical region then things start to go differently what is a critical region? it's the region around glass transition temperature and it is characterized by upper limit and the lower limit of the critical region the upper limit of the critical region uh, corresponds to the viscosity of the glass uh, equal to 10 to the power of uh, 13 so this temperature is usually called uh, T13 this region, critical region, is also called a new region so when we are cooling down the melt and reaches this point here the dependence of the refractive index changes changes this is the equilibrium line of uh, glass structure and the, the line of the equilibrium state of the glass structure and when we cool the glass melt very slowly very very slowly it means that an every te temporal point at every temperature the last structure has enough time to go from the metastable state to the equilibrium state and is this is the equilibrium line the equilibrium curve of the glass properties and so does the refractive index and uh, when we this line reaches the lower limit of the critical region then refractive index stops changes and it goes down while we cool the glass to the room temperature but if we cool the melt not so slow but a little bit faster then the refractive index will go here from uh, along the equilibrium state because at high temperatures the glass structure will have enough time and enough energy to uh, go to the equilibrium state but while cooling it down at some point it will stop uh, to have it will not here it will not have enough time to go to the equilibrium state and uh, the refractive index changes stop here and we will obtain the refractive index n1 if we cool the glass melt a little bit faster then we will obtain n2 refractive index and then a little bit more faster then we will obtain n3 refractive index but if we cool this glass melt very very fast very fast as for example during glass hardening then we will obtain the smallest refractive index compared to all previous cases so if we're talking about optical material and optical glass the main uh, optical parameter is refractive index and the main problem in optical glass is the inhomogeneity of the refractive index so optical inhomogeneity of glass is the deviation from the a complete equality of the refractive indexes of different parts of the glass these inhomogeneities can be of chemical or of physical nature if we are talking about chemical inhomogeneities we mean that refractive index deviation is caused by a difference in chemical composition and it is the case when we are dealing with the stries in russian it will be svili the physical nature the physical inhomogeneities are divided into two types during at uh, the first type physical inhomogeneities means that different parts of the glass were cooled in the 
annealing critical region at different rates. And the refractive index and their inner layers and the outer, the outer layers and the inner layers is different because um, it was uh, it changed according to different equilibrium curves. Because of this, the refractive index is different in different parts of the glass. And the physical inhomogeneities of the second type are the consequence of elastic glass deformation arising under the influence of residual stresses. <clears throat> so, what is the annealing point? What temperature should be used during annealing? Uh, the, the tendency of the refractive index to the equilibrium value and stress relaxation can occur at any temperature from the critical region. Theoretically, any, at any temperature, glass, a glass can be reduced to a state without inhomogeneities, and it means that there is no clearly defined annealing point. We can use several temperatures in the But usually, usually, the annealing point is the temperature at which uh, we define it. The annealing point as the temperature at which about 95% of the strands in the glass is relaxed within two or ten minutes. Annealing point corresponds to the glass viscosity equal to 10 to the power 13 points. Uh, why don't we use a uh, higher temperature than the annealing point? Why should we wait uh, 2 or 10 minutes to, uh, for stresses to relax? Because uh, at higher temperatures the relaxation of the stresses will happen instantly and it is not good for the uh, glass quality um, in the end. But under industrial conditions, when we are dealing with a lot of types of glasses, the practical annealing temperature is not equal to the annealing point. For example, for heavy crowns, the annealing uh, practical temperature is about uh, is 630 30 cent uh, cent degrees Celsius, and for medium flints, it's uh, 450 degrees. <coughs> so, what is the annealing region? The upper limit of the annealing region uh, is the annealing point. Okay, but what is the lower limit of the annealing region? The lower limit is also called strain point, and it is determined by the viscosity of the glass at which stress relaxation and structural changes in the refractive index are absent. The lower limit d depends on the glass composition, so it's different for different. It is different for different glasses also. <clears throat> the difference of the temperatures of the upper and the lower limit is about 150 degrees. And during this 150 degrees we have changed viscosity by 5.5 orders of magnitudes. So if we have uh, this graphic of the logarithmic of viscosity and adverse temperature, here the upper limit of the annealing region and the lower limit of the annealing region, uh, we see that it is the line. Uh, but it is theoretically the line that can be <clears throat> that uh, that is connected with this equation that can be uh, connected with this equation, and theoretically the change in the viscosity at this temperature gradient is uh, four point five orders of magnitude. But experimentally, it was obtained that uh, at low temperatures it is not the line. That's why we have uh, the change of viscosity of 5.5 uh, orders or magnitude. So if we look about uh, entire viscosity range, we can see that the lowest viscosity is uh, during melting of the glass batch and during fining, namely. Then we have uh, a working point here, softening point here, and a kneeling point here starts uh, at this viscosity. We have a transition range, which is called, uh, which is the part of the critical or annealing range. And at a uh, room temperature, glass has a 
uh, viscosity of 10 uh, in the power of 20 poise. <clears throat> so, what glass milling stages do we have? First stage is glass heating. Uh, namely, we can obtain uh, glass annealing uh, right after uh, the glass synthesis. So, uh, in this case, we uh, don't need the glass heating again. But if we have the glass at room temperature already, then we need to heat it again to the annealing point. A second stage is the relaxation zone here. Uh, it's like holding at a milling point or a milling temperature. Then we have critical cooling zone, which is very responsible, and non-critical cooling to room temperature here. And we have different types of annealing. They are linear, inertial, and accelerated annealing. Uh, when we are going through the first stage of the annealing, it means that we are hitting the glass blanks. Uh, the main purpose for this uh, stage is to heat the glass blanks with the fastest possible speed or that is allowed by the furnace, but not so high uh, for cracking these glass blanks. The average heating rate for small, medium and large blanks you can see here, and they are all depends they all depends on the size of the glass blank. Uh, but on practice we usually hit uh, very large blanks uh, to up to this rate, large blanks up to this, and all other blanks uh, we hit up to 120 degrees centigrade per hour. <clears throat> Several second stage is the relaxation zone. It means that we are holding the glass blank at uh, one temperature during some time. This task, uh, the task of this stage is to bring the entire glass mass to a homogeneous equilibrium state and release from all residual stresses. Usually the temperature of relaxation zone corresponds to the viscosity of glass equal to this one. And uh, with this vari variability of the temperature, uh, we usually we use the relaxation temperature that is uh, higher than the a milling point when we want to obtain high uniformity of the glass blanks, uniformity of uh, refractive index. Uh, we use, but we can also use the relaxation temperature that is lower than the a milling point by even 20 degrees, when we want to obtain good level of the biofringents inside of the glass blank. <clears throat> the duration of the relaxation zone um, is uh, strongly connected with the temperature. For example, if we look at this table, we can see that stress relaxation at uh, stress relaxation during uh, two minutes are held in at very high temperatures. But when we decrease the temperature, the time of the stress relaxation increases strongly. So that's why we can uh, produce relaxation zone either at 600 degrees for borosilicate crown and also at 500 degrees, but for a different time. Uh, what about deviation from the equilib equilibrium refractive index? Uh, when we have uh, some kind of the crown and uh, we use a holding temperatures, different holding temperatures, the deviation from the equilibrium refractive index before annealing is this one, but after annealing at different time and temperature is this one. So you can see that the deviation becomes became smaller. This means that glass blank became more uniform. <clears throat> um, 
duration of the relaxation strongly depends also strongly depends on the size of the glass uh, blank. If we want to obtain small deviation, small delta n, then we should increase the duration of the relaxation. But you know we can increase it uh, like without limits. We can't have endless relaxation of the glass blank. Uh, for this, we have uh, different restrictions for different kinds of the glass compositions and glass applications. That, uh, because of and using different glasses for different applications, which can calculate the duration of the relaxation zone. <clears throat> Critical uh, zone cooling. Uh, is uh, one of the most is the most responsible stage of the annealing. Here, for linear annealing, we have this equation for changing the temperature of the glass blank. During critical cooling, we have a constant temperature gradient across the with across the glass blank. But you know that between the relaxation period and the continuous cooling. Period, uh, period, we have some kind of the transition period, because during relaxation, uh, what is relaxation? It is uh, the uh, it is when we have all points of glass uh, with equal temperature, and continuous cooling means that different points of, of glass have different temperature, but they are having the constant gradient and the constant cooling rate. Because of this, because of this difference, we have uh, some kind of the transition zone, transition period between relaxation and critical cooling. And this transition, uh, transitional period, uh, its temperature range and duration depends on the blank size and thermal diffusivity. <coughs> uh, usually it is uh, the the transition range uh, usually should go at high temperatures that are close to the uh, annealing point or relaxation or close to the relaxation temperature because it will be better for the um, glass uniformity. So, uh, critical zone cooling rate depends on the blank size and uh, quality requirements that you have. Usual, um, dependence of critical cooling rate on generalized size of the glass blanks you can see here. And um, uh, if we are working on the factory and we are working in the case when we have a lot of glass blanks of different sizes, we really don't use different annealing furnaces for uh, blanks of different sizes. We just uh, uh, put all our glass blanks of different sizes in one uh, annealing furnace and use one of the standard <laughs> annealing regimes for all the glass samples. And the last stage of the annealing is the non-critical cooling. Here the task of the stage is the fastest possible cooling of glass to room temperature while maintaining the integrity of the blanks. So here we have almost the same uh, cooling rates as the heating rates of the first stage of the annealing process for different um, sizes of the blanks. <clears throat> uh, here the main point is that during non-critical cooling really very often so furnaces are cooled inertially. And inertially it means very, very long. And to speed up this process, sometimes furnaces uh, can be just opened. And the safe opening temperature for the annealing furnaces, uh, you can see here, they rise from 300 degrees Celsius for small blanks and uh, almost zero. So we can't, for example, open the, uh, the annealing furnace uh, when we are annealing big big and uh, flat blanks and uh, for example 440 degrees for big blanks of the glass 
So 40 is the safe opening temperature of the neuron. 30 is for very large blanks. So what about linear annealing? Uh, linear annealing means that um, the during cooling, the temperature of the glass blanks uh, goes down linearly with time. The disadvantages of the linear annealing is that uh, this cooling is like a type of the forced cooling and uh, we should use special hardware to make this forced cooling. Uh, it means that we have additional electricity course and the duration of critical cooling here is very very big and uh, we should be sure that there will be no sound power outages or interruptions during this annealing process. That's why, because of these disadvantages of the line annealing, the inertial type of the annealing uh, was introduced in the USSR in the 1940s. Uh, here the main disadvantage of, disadvantage of the inertial annealing is the lack of the maneuver maneuverability. So the mode of the annealing is set by the way the furnace is designed. What features of the inertial annealing do we have? The cooling rate of the in the beginning of the process and in the end of the process is different. When we anneal different glasses with different initial temperatures in one furnace, the rate of their critical cooling will be different. Or, for example, when we anneal glasses with the same annealing temperature but with different thermal diffusivity, the rate of the initial cooling will differ for them. So, as I was talking about when we are uh, working at the factory with a lot of glass blanks of different compositions and different sizes we are dealing and when we are dealing with natural annealing we have these problems. And uh, how these problems can be solved? On critical cooling uh, some of the glass blanks uh, are closed with the container uh, with a thermal insulator of refractory material which doesn't allow them to cool down very quickly but this method of annealing is not applicable for large blanks. Please remember this. And accelerated annealing. Here we have the relaxation temperature uh, that with the relaxation temperature of the glass decreases by several tenths of degrees, comparing with another types of annealing. And the duration here increases so much that a relaxation of part of the stresses should occur. The glass is cooled in the annealing area with a gradual increase. The cooling rate is calculated so that the residual stresses due to cooling are included in the difference between the allowable ones and those left for holding. That's why accelerated annealing are applicable only for blanks with small beam cross sections and for uh, blanks for non-responsible optical details. So the details that can be not of not very good quality. <clears throat> uh, here in the table there uh, we can compare the total duration of the linear and accelerated annealing of the same blank, glass blank. So we see it's <laughs> like three times difference. So comparing different annealing times, we have there linear annealing here, the inertial annealing here, and the accelerated annealing here. All these types are applicable but for different glass blanks and for different glass applications. Thank you for your attention and goodbye.